Welcome, Cornerstone. We're in week 38 of our One House Bible in a Year series. This week, we will be reading two books. We'll read the last of the major prophets, that's Daniel, and we'll read the first of the minor prophets, that's Hosea. Now, the first thing we need to remember as we move from major to minor prophets is that major and minor has nothing to do with the importance of their ministry or even the length of time that the prophets prophesied is simply due to the size of their books. So the major prophets we'll finish up this week are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and the one we'll read this week, Daniel. We will also start the minor prophets with the book of Hosea, and then the following two weeks we'll get into Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Because they're shorter, we will cover all 12 in just two and a half weeks. So the 12 minor prophets are sometimes known as the 12. We will always refer to them as the minor prophets or the 12 minor prophets because the 12 is also a designation that's sometimes given to the disciples of Jesus and to the tribes of Israel. So in order to avoid any confusion between those three, we will always refer to each of them as the 12 disciples, the 12 tribes, and the 12 minor prophets. Now, also before we get into this, you may notice as we move from the last of the major prophets, Daniel, into the first of the minor prophets, Hosea, that Hosea is actually longer than Daniel by chapter length, but by word count, <laughs> and that's what really matters because remember the chapters came later, by word count, all of the major prophets are larger than any of the minor prophets. So with that as an overview, let's take a look at the two books themselves. First of all, we'll be reading through the book of Daniel. This is one of the most well-known books in the Bible. It's one of the places where we have these images on nursery walls of Daniel and the lion's den, of, uh, of Daniel's three friends uh, in the fiery furnace. The, we sing songs about these stories. So in Daniel, you're going to see a lot of things very familiar. And then halfway through, there's going to be a switch where things become very unfamiliar and very strange. We'll talk about what happens there in a moment. First of all, Daniel is another apocalyptic book. The three main apocalyptic books in the Bible are Daniel, Ezekiel, and Revelation. We talked about apocalyptic writing last week and what that means, so we won't go over it again this week. If you are starting here, you can go back a week to discover a little bit more about what that means. Like Ezekiel that we just read, Daniel also lived and wrote while in exile in Babylon. And he has these vivid stories because the apocalyptic writing is the way the Hebrews communicated to each other while in a place where they were under the subjection of a foreign power without the foreign power knowing what it was that they were saying to each other. It has these bizarre images in addition to the fiery furnace and the lion's den. It also has bizarre images of a mysterious disembodied hand writing a warning, which is where we get the phrase, the writing is on the wall. Yes, from the book of Daniel. We also have some dream interpretation like we haven't seen since Joseph and Pharaoh back in Exodus in week four. We have flying creatures. We have all kinds of strange and interesting and fascinating stuff coming up in the book of Daniel. So let's take a look at it piece by piece so you'll see what's coming. First of all, the book of Daniel starts out in Daniel chapter one with the exile to Babylon. The fall of Jerusalem and the exile to Babylon happens. When they get there, Daniel and his friends are asked to eat the king's food, which usually people would jump on. They say, no, give us a test, give us simpler food, basically give us kosher food so we can honor God the way he's asked us to honor him as Hebrews. Uh, they do so and they pass the test. They're healthier and stronger than the others because kosher food tends to be far more nutritious and far more healthy for our bodies than the typical fats and sugars that wealthy people eat, which is what they would have been given at the king's table. We then move along to the king having a dream, and Daniel stands out by interpreting the king's dream much as Joseph did many, many, many centuries before this, and this gains him a great amount of status. He and his friends, as very smart people, were already being groomed to be among the elite of the Babylonians, but his dream interpretation is especially impressive, and especially as an exiled Jew in Babylon, to have this kind of status immediately put upon him is really extraordinary. So he and his three friends rise above all the others in leadership in Babylon. This then leads to 
chapter three, where we get the first of the really famous stories of Daniel, that is the fiery furnace. The king builds a massive statue of himself for the people to worship. But Daniel's three friends, now named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's their Babylonian names, their original Hebrew names, as we'll see this week, are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They don't bow to the image, and so they're thrown in the furnace. This, the furnace is so hot that those who throw them in are killed. They, however, are not killed, but are seen with a fourth person walking among them. The question is, who is this fourth person? person. We as Christians believe that this is Jesus in what is called a pre-incarnational epiphany. Yeah, it's a big theological term. What it means is incarnation means when Jesus was born. Pre-incarnation is before Jesus was born, and epiphany means an appearance of Jesus. So a pre-incarnational epiphany means an appearance of Jesus before he was born. We've already seen a couple of those uh, most famously, uh, Melchizedek is potentially a pre-incarnational epiphany when Abraham talks to the three uh, angels and bows down and calls one of them Lord. That is almost certainly a pre-incarnational epiphany, an appearance of Jesus before his birth in Bethlehem. So the other question that is often asked in this story is, okay, the three didn't bow, but where was Daniel? Did he bow? Well, obviously he didn't because later on he stood against um, th that kind of idolatry and was thrown into the lion's den, which we'll get into a moment. But the verse right before chapter three gives us a hint. Chapter two, verse 49, when you get there and you read it, it tells us that they were actually living in different places in the very large region of Babylon. So bottom line is, uh, you know, the, the statue was erected in the place where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lived. Daniel lived a long way away, so there was no there was no idol around him to bow down to, and so he wasn't a part of that story. That is the likely reason why he's not in that story. We then go to the second of Daniel's dream interpretations in Daniel chapter 4, and this one is about the king going crazy, uh, spending years eating grass like a cow, and then eventually repenting, which actually happens by the time that chapter is done. There's a long passage of time that happens in Daniel chapter 2. We then get the, uh, sorry, Daniel chapter 4. We then get to Daniel chapter 5 and the famous writing on the wall. We now have a new king. Nebuchadnezzar is gone, and Belshazzar arrives. We are about to see two more kings coming up, Darius and Cyrus as well. Why does the king's name constantly change in the book of Daniel? Because as short as the book of Daniel is, it actually encompasses a very long period of time. And secondly, the, the stability, Babylon was actually quite unstable at this time. It was powerful. It was the world power. But because of that, there were all kinds of things happening among of those who wanted to gain that power. And so you have four different kings who come and go throughout the length of Daniel. So take note of the, the change of the king's names as things go along. This is also why policy tends to change from being good to Daniel and his friends to being mean to Daniel and his friends back and forth because of these power plays, okay? So that some of that you'll notice in the writing on the wall chapter in Daniel 5. We then come to the most famous image of Daniel, and that is the lion's den in Daniel 6. What happens is the Babylonian leaders are jealous of Daniel because he is, his status before the king is so strong, so they decide, we're going to kill him. The only way to get him killed is to allow the king to pass a law that will kill him, but the king won't do that. So what? basically they ask, where's his weakness? And his only weakness is his faithfulness to God. So they have the king pass a law that says you can't pray or ask even any petition to any ruler or any king other than the king. And Daniel, of course, prays regularly to God like he does. He gets thrown in the lion's den, and you get to read that wonderful story in Daniel chapter 6. After Daniel 6, so halfway through the book, six of 12 chapters. After that, everything shifts. Before, uh, up through Daniel 6, it's story after story after story, all the stuff, these images and ideas that we're familiar with. Then in chapters 7 through 12, everything shifts, and we the storyline fades away, and the dreams and visions predominate. When you're reading chapter 7 through 12, if you've read the book of Revelation before, this will feel really familiar. Because a lot of the images and a lot of the visions in Daniel are repeated or are echoed later on in the book of Revelation. It's a real big shift. It's apocalyptic writing 
at its finest. It's the Hebrews speaking to each other about their eventual deliverance using images that the Babylonians will not be able to understand. Okay. At the end of Daniel, then midway through this week, we will leave the major prophets and we will read the first of the minor prophets, namely the book of Hosea. Hosea's story is astonishing, heartbreaking, beautiful, and really hard to grasp. Uh, it's not as familiar as the stories in Daniel, but it should be because it's really something else. First of all, Hosea takes place long before Daniel. Again, when we get to the major and minor prophets, they are not written primarily in chronological order. They are written in more or less in size order, big, the big chunk and then the small chunk. Okay. So Daniel takes place very close to the end of the Old Testament narrative. But uh, Hosea takes place about 200 years before that. Hosea takes place before the exile, before the fall of Jerusalem, and even before the fall of Samaria and the northern kingdom 150 years before the, the fall of Jerusalem. So it's we go way back in time from Daniel when we get to Hosea, okay? So basically what you've got is the beginning of the prophecies, one of the first prophecies to say, hey, you're about to be in trouble, which will eventually end up in the exile in Babylon. And the book of Hosea really goes to the heart of what we've already talked about, what I call the rule of the reluctant prophet. That is, anybody who wants to be a prophet isn't paying attention to what prophets have to endure. Here's Hosea's story. In his story in chapters one and three, you're going to see, uh, and the rest of it is prophecy. In chapters one and three, you're going to see a story, which is this. He is asked to marry a prostitute. This wife, after he treats her wonderfully, leaves and goes back into prostitution. He is then asked by God to go and find her where she's being sold in the marketplace like a piece of meat as a prostitute. He is to buy her, bring her back into his home, and treat her as his wife again, and not as the prostitute that she became. This will then become an illustration for the people that this is how they are behaving towards God. God has loved them and taken them in as his bride. They have gone and prostituted themselves to other gods by worshiping idols. And God says, I will buy you back again, and I will treat you as my bride again, even though you have prostituted yourself with other gods. This is a story to us, but Hosea actually had to do it. Okay. Imagine this in Israel at the time. He's their prophet. He, it's like it's like the pastor of the church going out and marrying a prostitute and everybody going, okay, that's weird, but okay, she becomes his wife. Maybe, okay, that's great. Then she goes back into prostitution, and what does the pastor do? He doesn't wipe his hands of her. He goes and brings her back again, literally having to buy her off the auction block and treats her again as his loving wife. This is something they will never forget, and it's about as vivid an illustration of how much God loves us and how badly we have behaved towards him, as we will see anywhere in the Bible. So pay attention to that story this week in Hosea. It's an extraordinary one. So as we conclude, let's take a look at what we're to look for this week. First of all, in the book of Daniel, in, in book of Daniel, notice the passage of time. You'll see that with the change of kings, four different kings, big passage of time. Remember also that the book of Daniel happens not in Israel or Judah, but in Babylon, hundreds of miles away. Note that it is one of the last of the Old Testament books chronologically, and note the faith and the courage of Daniel and his friends that even when things go bad, they do the right thing. Then when you read Hosea, take note that you are now jumping back in time about 200 years from the book of Daniel, and note the heartbreak of God over our sin. It's something we don't often consider. We often consider our own heartbreak and our own loss. We seldom consider what our sin does to the heart of God. And this comes as close to a, aside from the crucifixion of Jesus, I don't know that there's a more vivid illustration in scripture of the heartbreak of God over our sin. And also note that the, the rule of the prophets, that how challenging it is to actually be a true prophet of God because of what the prophets have to endure in order to get the essential message of God through them to us. All right. It's an amazing week of reading. Two extraordinary books with four vivid stories and a whole bunch of amazing prophecy. This is something that will keep you awake, that will keep you reading, that will absolutely engage you. I hope you have as great a time with it as I do when I read these books, and we'll see you next week.